The evening of June 17th, 1994, was the most impactful moment in the history of the Bronco brand. Lightning fast and bizarre developments tonight in the O.J. Simpson story. We're seeing live pictures right now. The football hero believed to be a passenger in that Ford Bronco. That, drove that night was the slow speed police chase of the white Bronco that changed America. Detectives from the Los Angeles Police Department sought and obtained a warrant for the arrest of O.J. Simpson, charging him with the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Lyle Goldman. You can't talk about the Bronco without talking about this moment. In fact, for many people, this is the only thing they know about the Bronco. It was a defining moment. Lots of questions still swirling around the case, but still no comment on reports that a bloody ski mask and glove were found on Simpson's estate. But did it kill the Bronco? Is the negative publicity and the horrible connotations of being associated with a violent crime the reason Ford canceled the brand just two years later? That's what we're going to find out. I'm Sinarian Glenton, and this is Bring Back Bronco, an eight-part serial documentary about the rise, fall, and rebirth of the Ford Bronco. And right now, we're all about the fall. We spent the last three episodes trying to figure out why Ford killed the Bronco. Bronco 2, the OPEC oil crisis, even Chevrolet all took their shots at it. But it survived, which leads us to the most high-profile suspect on our list, O.J. Simpson. Is he the real killer? This is Chapter 4, The End of the Road. Football fans, Ford Bronco fans, fans of the Naked Gun movies, everyone saw the chase a little differently. But what about the Ford employees? What was going on inside Ford that night? Well, I've got a bit of an inside scoop. On that night, I was a skinny 20-year-old college student making $15.09 an hour, working on the line at the Chicago assembly plant. I worked on the assembly line uh, with, with this a great group of people. It was just like really funny. I remember uh, they tried to teach me the tire install. It was a big machine. You run it up against and it secures the bolt into the tires. And then you go to the next one, put the five bolts in. The machine comes along, you put that in, and every other car, you have to throw the spare tire into the trunk. And I just remember having like one Popeye arm from throwing the one tire. The thing that I remember most about that summer is so clear was um, watching TV in the Oasis. And that's what they called the snack rooms. And I, I will never forget watching on the screen inside of a Ford plant. Everyone. I remember we had, when we were talking on the line about when Ron Goldman and Nicole Simpson were murdered, that was the whole line talking about it, right? But during that chase, I remember a guy doing, better buy Ford stock. Look at that. That's a commercial. That's a commercial for the Bronco. But was it a commercial for the Bronco? What exactly was the impact on the brand? The value of a brand and what impacts it is really hard to pin down. So I called up Carl Brower. He's one of the best automotive analysts in the business. When I was an automotive reporter with NPR, I could always go to Carl for answers to those really tough questions. Questions like, what happens when your truck is driven on national TV by a man accused of murder. Those are things that raise awareness of the name and of the brand more than they raise a negative connotation with the brand. Uh, and, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. I mean, there really is almost no such thing as bad awareness in, in most markets and certainly in the automotive market. Without a doubt, the wall-to-wall -wall television coverage put the name Bronco on the lips of everyone. But is that really a good thing? Well, I think it's positive when you consider the fact that someone chose a Bronco as his potential getaway vehicle, right? I mean, uh, you know, he wasn't in some small economy car. He wasn't even in a sports car. He was in a Bronco. 
which I always thought was kind of fitting because the TV commercials from 1966 always boasted the Bronco was perfect for getting away from it all. The Bronco will really take you off the beaten path, away from the crowd. I guess some people took that a little more literally than others. So I know what it looked like from inside a Ford factory, but what about in the offices? Were there really executives running around with their hair on fire? Well, apparently, no. I mean, it would have been fun to see. You see, it was 7 p.m. in Detroit. It was a Friday. The offices were pretty empty. The only place where things were going crazy, the customer call center. Uh, the center was open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., as I recall. That's Robert Parker. In the future, he's going to play a role in the struggle to revive Bronco. But for now, he's just a supervisor in Ford's call center. The center had over 200 agents answering calls, fielding calls from the United States. It really ran the gamut in, from, you know, your standard questions to the weird and the wacky. But today was the weirdest and wackiest of all. Calls started streaming in. People started calling us, asking us if we were watching what was unfolding, you know, on the freeways of Los Angeles. Keep in mind, there's no social media for people to post comments to. So instead, and this may seem odd today, they call Ford's customer hotline. So I started having our customer service representatives that were coming and asking me if I knew anything about it and what they should say to people. Now, this might be a good time to point out that while Robert was the supervisor, this was his second day on the job. Certainly wasn't involved in any part of your training and it wasn't something that any one of us had encountered before. There wasn't much that he could tell them because the people calling in knew more than he did. You know, at the time, there weren't televisions in the office. There wasn't the Internet. So some people were huddled around radios trying to get information, making outbound calls to friends trying to get information. But we were a bit in the dark about what was going on and how that related to a Bronco and how that related to Ford Motor Companies. The call volume was so high that Robert ended up staying late that night. So despite being in the middle of the storm, he actually never saw any of the chase live. You know, I just always thought it bizarre that Bronco got so much coverage out of it. You know, it was like, I wonder if it would have been a Camry, you know, if anybody would have ever remembered, um, or even a luxury car. But for some reason, the fact that it was a Bronco made it so much more memorable. Over the years, I've wondered what the chase meant for Bronco sales. So I put that question to Bailey Sasoy Moore, our favorite history expert. It did have a huge effect on Bronco sales. Well, what was the fact? It went up. They, oh, hold on a second. Say, say that one more time, which was like, that is a surprise. So immediately after the Bronco yeah. comes out. For about three months after the chase, Bronco sales saw a peak. You also had people doing things like showing up at the dealerships to take photos in the cars. I mean, this was considered this big deal. And you almost have to equate it to um, Bonnie and Clyde with their Dodge or the Model T with uh, John Dillinger. These cars become synonymous with the crime and sort of inseparable from that crime in the future. So it does. It becomes as big a part of Americana. I'm not going to lie. When Bailey said that Bronco sales went up after the chase, I was a little shocked. I started out asking if that had killed the Bronco, and she's saying it gave it a boost. So does that mean Ford made money off the chase? That kind of information, though, only exists inside of Ford offices. So I reached out to David Scott. He was the head of Ford's public affairs department at the time. We in the public affairs community uh, received a number of calls, but it was mostly from the news media um, asking about specifications of the Bronco. You know, what is the Bronco? How many do you sell a year? What's the wheelbase? What's the engine kind of stuff? That doesn't surprise me. It was early evening and reporters would be looking for facts to flesh out their story. But surely the next morning, 
would have been a firestorm of meetings at Ford headquarters. Or maybe not. I don't remember anything untoward. I mean, typically on a typical day, my office was uh, two doors down from the chairman's office. I would usually go in in the morning and, and, and brief him on you know anything I knew that was going on in the world that might affect our business. So I'm sure I briefed him, but I don't remember anything specifically um, that anybody was upset about anything or you know deeply concerned. It really had nothing to do with us other than the fact that Cowling happened to be driving his white Bronco. Wow. I don't remember anything untoward. This is the highest ranking PR person in the company. The guy whose job is to alert the chairman about world events. And he describes it just like another day. And the highway chase happened on the Friday. So this meeting didn't even take place until Monday, three days after this all went down. So what about Bailey's claim that sales went up? David Scott has an answer for that too. I think one of the curiosities, one of the happenstances was it so happened that in that time period, the which was June, the Western Region Sales Office had ordered a bunch of extra white Broncos as a promotion, nothing to do with OJ at all. Uh, just as a promotion of Broncos. Yeah, it had nothing to do with the chase at all. It was just that white vehicles always sell better in the summer, especially California. So dealers had planned a big sales event. And those things started arriving about a week after the incident. And was sold out immediately, and people accused us of taking advantage of it, but we didn't. It was an order that had happened maybe three months before, and just by coincidence, several hundred of these vehicles arrived uh, during that period after the OJ incident. Now, if you take David Scott at his word, and he's retired now and has no reason to give me corporate spend, the events of June 17th, 1994 had nothing to do with it. It was just all business. In the weeks that followed, stories about the chase and the coming trial filled the airways. It was millions and millions of brand references for many. It turned the Bronco into a notorious vehicle. Which leaves us with the big question. Did the chase of the century kill the Bronco? You know, I, I hate to use the word kill it, by the way. We discontinued the name and substituted the expedition as the product for the Bronco. Yes, but why? Well, you, 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 you're coming from it, if I may be so bold to say, a little from the wrong side, which is the de- it wasn't a decision to kill the Bronco. It was a decision to launch the expedition. One last piece of business I need to tie up. Whatever happened to the white Bronco from the chase? Well, Al Cowling's the owner, sold it to his agent for 75 grand. The agent then put it in a garage and locked the door. Over the years, a few people have tried to buy it, but he has always said no. One day, he got an offer from a tour company that takes people to where celebrities died. They wanted to use the white Bronco and drive tourists to where Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were killed. The agent turned that down as well. I've even found a guy in Hollywood who is renting a white Bronco for bachelor parties so you could take one last drive with your best bros. But that wasn't the real Bronco. The real Bronco is here. Our museum is dedicated to crime consequences throughout the ages, all the way from medieval to colonial pirates, Wild West, serial killers, all the way through prohibition up to modern day pop culture crimes. That's Candace Cook, and this is the Alcatraz East Crime Museum. And of all places, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. I would say John Wayne Gacy's clown suits are very popular. (laughs) Um, Anything that we have on serial killers and forensics. Ted Bundy's car is definitely the one that'll give you the creeps the most. He was famous for liking the Volkswagen because he could remove the passenger seat and put his victims in it. So it is still removed, passenger door open. Definitely get a vibe when you come down here. And sitting just a few feet away from that creepy car is the white Bronco. Yes, that white Bronco. 
I'd say when people see it, they're not expecting it. When they come downstairs and they just see it, they're just amazed. And then they are in disbelief that it's the real Bronco vehicle. And it really is. We have the video playing, the Bronco signage that says, yes, it is real. It really is the one from the chase. And somehow it ended up here in East Tennessee. I think it's just one of those iconic pieces of history, you know, everybody remembers turning on the TV, watching with, you know, millions of people, that two hour long, slow car chase on the interstate. And so when they see it here in person, it's just amazing to see. That specific Bronco is off the road because of the chase. But when it comes to the entire brand, it is safe to say, and I'm well aware of the irony, the famous football player and actor is not the real killer. So what did kill the Bronco? I need to go back in time a little bit. The police chase was 1994, but for the next suspect, we have to return to 1991, when the Bronco 2 was shelved. Ford's replacement for it was a smaller, fuel-efficient SUV called the Explorer. Its first year, sales were promising, and the future looked bright. Now, I'm sure you've heard of baby boomers. Well, I know you've heard of them because they won't stop talking about themselves. The folks born after World War II. They were the biggest population spike ever. Well, what do you think the boomers were doing in the late 80s and early 90s? Answer, making babies. The demographic phenomenon is called an echo boom. Those young families were demanding something different from their vehicles. Station wagons were out of fashion and minivans hadn't yet reached their peak. The Explorer was built to fill that gap. And it had one key difference with the Bronco, the number of doors. You see, the Bronco, through all of its evolutions and redesigns, was always a two-door vehicle. The Explorer had four. Parents were getting tired of getting out of their truck, lifting up the little lever, and leaning their seat forward so their kids could scramble out of the back seat. I can hear the arguments now. So they built a bigger version of the Explorer to replace the Bronco. And if you're looking for someone to blame for the two-door Bronco being replaced in the product line with a four-door SUV, you can blame those kids in the back seat, those echo boomers. Funny thing, that term echo boomer never really stuck. You probably know them as millennials. So yeah, blame the millennials. Why not, right? They get blamed for everything else. And that was it. After 30 years, blazing a new trail of excitement, six generations of redesigns. See the Ford Bronco 2. After 1,148,926 Broncos rolled off the line, you're ahead in a Ford all the way. It was over. When we heard it was being discontinued, I was sad because the Bronco nameplate was going away. That's Todd Zercher. He wrote the book on Bronco. You know, the thing had been in production for 30 years, and I was like, man, you know, it's really sad that that's going away. Todd was sad, but he was also puzzled. To him, there was a very simple solution that Ford was ignoring. I think they could have just renamed it a Bronco. You know, their their four-door successor, I think they could have just kept the Bronco name going and, and, and applied it to a new family of vehicles. Todd's idea rattled around in my head for a few days, and the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. I mean, I get that the truck had to be changed, but couldn't they do a redesign and still continue the name? Think about it. In 1978, they essentially released an entirely new truck, but kept the Bronco name, and it was a huge success. Why not just build a four-door Bronco? Well, I took that question to David Scott. The the brand people decided that they wanted to go with a new name to show that there was a completely new vehicle more related to the Explorer than to the old Bronco. It was David's job to erase the Bronco's name. Of course, he didn't frame it that way. My group had to establish the expedition as a name. Expedition. 
That's the name they chose for their new four-door Bronco-sized SUV. Management was trying to reimagine Ford Motor Company. In 96, we were three years into a total reconstitution of Ford as a global company, and it changed the way the company operated. And so I think the management was looking at what are the new things we can do rather than rely on the old things that we've done. You can argue whether that's a good decision or not, but that was you know, the process of the decision. David left one detail out in his explanation of why the name was changed. It's so obvious, maybe he felt he didn't need to mention it, but consider the names of the SUVs Ford debuted between 1991 and 2000. Explorer, Expedition, Excursion, Escape. Okay, it horrifies me that it could be that simple. That the name Bronco, with all the heritage and brand value that it carried, was dropped because it didn't start with the letter E. Sometimes the answer to the most complex question is alliteration? It wasn't a single thing that led to the end of the Bronco, but it wasn't a death by a thousand cuts either. It was a series of full force body blows coming from all sides that brought it down. Todd Zercher. I, I think I think what killed it really was it was kind of a dinosaur. It was sort of an anachronism by that point. Um, the 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 full size Blazer had been killed five or six years earlier. Um, the Plymouth Trail Duster and Dodge Ram Charger no longer existed. So it was really sort of a a market entity of of one, and and really the the small SUVs or the Ford Explorers killed it. Um, uh, it, it was it was taken out by a member of its own family, if you will. <laughs> The Bronco did have a real storied place in Ford's lineup, but I think I think it gave motivation to those of us who were still Bronco people, who were Bronco enthusiasts, we were in Bronco clubs. It gave us a stronger determination to enjoy our trucks, keep them going, even if the nameplate didn't exist anymore, that we were going to, you know, keep the keep the dream alive, so to speak. Terminating a product line takes years almost as long as launching a new one. I found planning documents in the archives dating back to 1993 that analyzed life after Bronco. Officially, however, Bronco's death was June 12th, 1996. Ford marked another milestone in production yesterday at the Michigan truck plant as the last of a long-running series of trucks rolled off the assembly line. For the occasion of the last Bronco being produced, Ford staged a little parade. A vintage 1970 Ford Bronco was the lead vehicle as Michigan trucks celebrated... That little red Bronco belonged to none other than Jeff Trapp. He's the guy that founded Bronco Graveyard. Uh, I was privileged of being invited down to the Michigan truck plant. So I took my vintage 1970 Bronco down there and we put it back on the assembly line and... We rolled it back down the assembly line, and there was a, the last iconic Bronco, 1996, was a white Bronco like the OJ one. Then the first expedition came after that. It felt like a wait, part funeral, part celebration. It's not the end of the era, it's the beginning of another. Bronco really was like an ugly stepchild to him for a long time. They went to the Expedition, and then you had the Lincoln Navigator, which was a luxury vehicle. Those cars did the job, but neither really did what the Bronco did. People wanted an off-road vehicle they could take hunting, fishing, going four-wheeling. I just kept my hopes up. Uh, you know, I go, well, I got a family to feed. I got four or five workers here that need depend on me for a living. We got to keep the Bronco going. We you know, keep selling parts for them, and ho hopefully one day Ford will look back and say, hey, we need the Bronco again. One other important thing happened that year. You see, 1996 is not just the year Ford built their last Bronco. It's also the year they left Detroit. In December, Ford announced they were moving all 2,500 employees at their downtown offices out to Dearborn, out to the suburbs. It was the end of an era in so many ways. Mm. 
That brings us to the halfway point of the series. We've covered the rise and fall of the Ford Bronco. Now it's time for the rebirth, which it turns out was actually the bumpiest road of all. As the calendar turns from the 1990s to the 2000s, two things happen. Around the country, Bronco Nation grows, solidifies, and even organizes. And inside Ford, an underground forms, a group of Ford employees that secretly plot to bring back Bronco. That's next time. Chapter 5, Driving in the Dark. I'm Sonarin Glenton. Be sure to subscribe to Bring Back Bronco on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen. O.J. Simpson is depicted as a part of a news event. He did not participate in this podcast and does not endorse or have any affiliation with Ford or this podcast.